we'll, we'll sort of drift in. It's, it's just gone three o'clock. We'll just drift into the, the thing. So how, how did you... Um, I'm trying to remember exactly when you started and how COVID was going at the time, whether you knew what you were letting yourself in for. Yeah, no, it was after it was after the first lockdown. So, um, um, yeah, it was kind of early September that I started in the role, which was a, obviously a strange time to start a new job. Um, uh, but it's, I mean, we're not allowed to meet as all party groups in person for, until at least summer recess next year so obviously it's um it's different um it's you know you make the best of it like all of our work is online um you know you've got to change the way that you interact with people um like say like we were saying before there's some advantages to that you can get more done in a day if you don't have to travel up and down to london all the time um but you know there are there are some advantages to having people in a room and I think Prasek's value to a lot of our supporters outside Parliament over the long term has been the ability to get in a room together, both to talk about issues and just to kind of meet each other and interact with each other. So you've got to try and find ways for people to have those opportunities without actually being together. It's, you know, you've just got to think things through in a different way. Um, well, the agenda some pretty crowded rooms as well for Prasek. I mean, yeah, yeah. very well attended meetings. Yeah. yeah, not a lot of social distancing in those rooms, no. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, anything but. Um, so, so let's let's ask a bit about Prasek and then a bit about yourself. So, so Prasek isn't a word; it's a, an acronym, right? What does it stand for? Well, it's the Old Party Parliamentary Group for Renewable and Sustainable Energy. Um, so it's sort of an acronym. I think it's the, the way that they could try and make a word of it, of the, the kind of jumble of letters back in 1979 when it was founded. Um, it's, to, to kind of, to summarise what it is, it's, it's the, an all party group is a kind of a, a big group of parliamentarians from, um, from all parties and across both houses of parliament that are kind of looking at particular issues in detail so sometimes all party groups focus on countries and sometimes they focus on specific issues and our issue or set of issues is renewable and sustainable energy and um, there are a few all party groups that are op that operate in that kind of space so the environment group the net zero appg the climate change appg um but i think i'm right in saying that we're certainly the longest standing and we're still the biggest kind of parliamentary caucus if you like um, so on the parliamentary side, we've got kind of 140, 150 MPs, peers uh, that we uh, count within our membership and communicate with regularly, make sure that they're briefed and know what's coming up. Um, and outside of parliament, we're supported by um, a lot of different organisations. So, you know, like businesses across the renewable and sustainable energy sectors or um organizations kind of outside the kind of core energy sector but who are interested in the energy transition or who are committed to decarbonizing um so we have you know we have really interesting discussions on technical detail we have big picture discussions on policy direction um we work across kind of three themes so one is kind of core issues around energy and the transition and um, two is looking at um what that transition looks like for like different sectors and different industries that are outside of the of the energy industry so it can be anything from what it would mean for a big university to what it would mean for a big football club for example like you can be quite creative actually i think with um with that kind of angle and then the third dimension is quite an quite an exciting thing and it's not been kind of formally announced yet but uh, Prasag has a kind of a, a coordinating role for parliamentary activity in the run up to COP26. Uh, so over the course of the next year, we're going to be focused a lot on um, on climate change as a diplomatic priority, with the COP as the main focus. But also, the UK has got the presidency of the G7 in 2021, and that's potentially another big kind of climate moment. So there's it's a big agenda, and obviously we can't work in a normal way, but it doesn't diminish the importance of any of this any of this stuff we've got coming up 
Yeah. That's very like Glen Eagles, really, isn't it? You know, the Glen Eagles G G8 and uh, Climate Conference yeah. in yeah. 2005, was it? I think. Yeah. That was yeah. that was really important for carbon capture and storage, made a big difference. Yeah, so, I mean, Glen Eagles was, I mean, that was a massive moment of, I mean, among other things, it was, it was a big moment of civil society activism because it was the, that was a rather make public history campaign. I remember there was a, an awful lot of people up campaigning around that but then you've got uh, it we had the it was then it was the g8 obviously um lock in 2013 which there, there weren't great outcomes on climate there were there were better outcomes on hunger but since then i think it's become pretty clear that multilateralism has been put under quite a lot of strain um and the paris agreement i think i would certainly characterize it as the was the one big kind of success story of multilateralism in a really, really challenging decade. Mm -hmm. um, and the summit next year is definitely the biggest moment of climate diplomacy since the Paris Agreement was signed. Uh, and it's a mm -hmm. solemn like responsibility, diplomatic responsibility the UK government's got as, as president. Do we know where the uh, summit's going to be? Is that being, is yeah, still in, in, in Glasgow? Yeah. Yeah, in Glasgow. So they're still working towards a kind of an in-person summit. I had a call last week with the with the kind of organizers in Glasgow. Um so there'll be I don't know if people on the call are familiar with the way that the kind of cops worked in the past, but there's kind of a blue zone and a green zone. So the blue zone is like a that's where like the real negotiations take place and that's kind of controlled by the presidency. Um, working with the United Nations and then the green zone is kind of the activist space so that's where side meetings take place and things like that uh, and they'll be close to each other in Glasgow um, but yeah they're planning for a for a summit as as normal but I mean the stakes were high anyway because it's kind of this is the the point at which th things really need to ratchet up um, mm. but obviously the delay like raises the stakes even more because Obviously, we're another year down the line. Yeah. And it's yeah. yeah. Shorter. Shorter. Yeah. So just, just to, sorry to keep sort of informed a bit going, but should ask a bit, how, how did you come to be here? What's your, what's your background? That's, how how, that's how did you end up? That's a long story. What, um, what, was, your, what was your degree? Well, let's ask that. It's at politics and international relations, um, but it was ages ago. It was at Lancaster <laughs> Union, like 2003 to 2006. Um, so, I, I mean, I worked for a member of parliament for a couple of years after graduating. Um, and that was, you know, what I wasn't specifically working on these issues. It was just kind of, it was the yeah. general work that you do in, a, in an MP's office, anything from kind of opening the post to writing speeches. But it gives you a kind of a sense of how, the parliamentary kind of process works and how decisions are made. I think like the big takeaway from it and relevant to this discussion, I think, and these issues is that there's a lot more that goes into a political decision than just like, having a decent argument or being right about something. Like there's a whole set of dynamics. So you can have as much evidence as you want, but you need the right strategy to, to get the right decision. Um, and after that, I went to work in, in sport for a couple of years, um, doing kind of political engagement for the major sports. Um, but the thing that I, the thing that used to kind of, um, we mentioned make poverty history actually earlier, and that was all when I was at uni. And um, the thing that I was really interested in was kind of humanitarian aid and international development uh, and the kind of international politics around that. So I went to work for CAFOD, which is a big Catholic NGO um, and I was the kind of head of government relations there for five years and halfway through that period Pope Francis became Pope and changed the the kind of issue priorities of the church to what is termed in in the kind of Vaticanist human ecology but effectively it was kind of sustainable development and climate change um, and CAFOD as the kind of lead on um, environmental issues within the kind of global Catholic humanitarian family was heavily involved with the development of the thinking around that. And I kind of played my part in that 
um, which is how I ended up working on on environmental issues. Um, so my first COP was as part of, of that work in 2013. And um, while CAFOD had an international focus and an international role, it also was a UK organization. So um, through that, just that was kind of a meandering journey into working on, on UK politics or UK policy around climate change issues and then increasingly around energy issues. So I was part of a group that worked hard on negotiating the coal phase out in ahead of the 2010 general election. There was a pledge that was made by the then party leaders, David Cameron, Nick Clegg, uh, Ed Miliband about phasing out coal. Um, um, Without CCS. 2015, 2015 election it was, February 2015, and then it was delivered like- But it, but it was coal without carbon capture and storage, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And um, yeah, part of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was like- we, It didn't make any difference, but I think that was what, what was said. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then since then, I've been freelance. I'm uh, just for personal reasons, I moved back up to Manchester, which is where I'm from. Um, but I missed working on the issues. I wanted to work on the issues that I'd worked on for the last few years and um, became a consultant. And then Brexit happened. So I helped a few organizations think through what the, what the implications of Brexit would be in environmental policy terms and in terms of legislation. And then a roundabout route to um to Praseg, which is um basically i kind of stepped away from like parliament facing political work a few years ago but there's a lot of big issues that are coming into play over the course of the next year and um, Praseg's a i think it's an influential um organization i think it has stimulates a lot of the right discussions and it's listened to and the magnitude of some of the decisions that are coming up over the course of the next year just made it a good fit for me and fortunately for yeah. them so that's kind of how how it happened yeah. and and the magnitude of the urgency because of the cop i mean it's, it really is coming together isn't it for sure yeah i, would, I mean i know yeah. covid slowed things up but what would have happened if we hadn't had the extra year well, we've got everything done that's a good question um i mean it's an un, it's an un, unanswerable question in a way because I'm sure that I'm sure that there would have been ways that it would have been made successful. I think I think a few things about this. COVID has obviously slowed an awful lot of things down, but Brexit has slowed things down anyway in terms of like the development and delivery of of kind of big ticket policy stuff that we're waiting for, and we can go through that in a minute because there's a lot of it. That was that is still outstanding and has been for quite a while now. Um, so, if you accept the kind of premise that the first stage of good leadership is to kind of lead by example, then it's pretty important that all of that domestic stuff is introduced and is the process has started to deliver that before the COP. And I'm not sure that that would have happened, irrespective of COVID. But it might have done. Like it's impossible to say because obviously the crisis has taken over um, and COVID obviously throws up a number of different challenges. Um, I think the other thing that is a, the other factor in it is that, you know, partly because of Brexit and just political forces that are at work, the UK is, I think, still looking to kind of redefine its role on the global stage and that, um, the presidency of the COP was always going to be a big moment in that respect. Um, so I think it would have focused people's minds enough, definitely. The delay is not great in terms of the time scale because it's really tight as it is, but you know, it, it is what it is. And I think you've got to use it to like to turn the agenda to your advantage. And I think it creates opportunities for leadership by example and for proper concerted climate diplomacy that that maybe wouldn't have been there if the delay hadn't happened. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I kept you from your, your presentation, absolutely fascinating stuff, and hopefully it's uh, set the stage for your actual presentation, Tom. So over to you, if that's okay. Absolutely. Well, thanks for those questions. And um, I mean, we've covered, we've covered bits of it already. Um, okay, well, sorry about but, that. No, it's, it, it's all good. I mean, I've not prepared any slides, partly because 
you know, I've watched the previous webinars and it, it seems to work well when there's kind of an informal element to it. But, you know, if yeah. people have got questions, I'd love to answer them and I'll, I'll happily follow up with anything written if it's useful to people. Um, but I mean, you know, basically like the science is unequivocal. You know, the statutory committee, the climate change committee that was created by the Climate Change Act, which advises the government on how to achieve net zero has made the case for it. The government has accepted that case. Parliament has legislated for it. Um, so kind of all we have to do now is like get on with it, you would think. And obviously that's true, but I assume the reason we're all here is because we all know it's not as simple as that. Um, so, I mean, Praseg has got his part to play in this. I've introduced Praseg and I'll come back to our role kind of at the end. But I just want to say that I know that the main focus for this series is carbon capture and storage. Um, we, John and Karis and I, and when we were talking about what this session would look like, um, I think we, well, I, I made it as clear as I could that me coming to a, an organisation like this or a group like this talking about CCS from any sort of a technical perspective was a terrible idea because you'd see through it within within minutes because I do you know, webinars to learn about CCS rather than the other way around. Um, but CCS, CCS and like policy in relation to CCS is part of an overall package um, when it comes to the energy transition. The Committee on Climate Change has, has said that it's, it absolutely has to be part of the mix, mix. So when I'm talking about CCS in this presentation, I am talking about it as part of that, that wider package. So it's a little bit more big picture. There might be times when I refer to it specifically, but, but I am very much talking about it as part of that as a kind of a vital and implicit part of that energy transition. Um, and there's politics in kind of all of this around the energy transition, and it's not all particularly clean cut, but I'll try and kind of, I don't know, like map a little bit of a way through it. Um, some of it won't be news to, to you, to any of you, but hopefully it'll be, you know, a helpful perspective or something that can stimulate an idea or a little bit of a discussion and, the door is absolutely open to come and get involved in Prasig and to come and to come and follow up um, either on, you know, in the rest of this discussion or, in, or afterwards. Um, so there's like, with, like anything, there's some good news and there's some bad news. Um, just rattle through the good news quickly. I mean, obviously, we've got science or the, the, the weight of scientific evidence that the transition is essential and the CCS needs to be part of it. Um, and the science itself is obviously not good news. Um, it's dire, but the scientific, the weight of scientific evidence is profound um, and unequivocal. Uh, we've got the law, um, the net zero law, we've got the Climate Change Act as well. Um, and we've got the, the Climate Change Committee, which is obviously a, um, a leading group of experts and they've got their statutory role. Um, the next example of which will be seen on, on the 9th of December when they introduced the sixth carbon budget. Um, expect to see plenty about CCS in there. Um, the sixth carbon budget is going to be the really tricky bit. It's the, it's the bit after to, after 2030. Um, so there might be a bit of a scrap about it in Parliament. We'll see. Uh, it's certainly something we're going to keep our eye on, uh, a close eye on. And, and as Prasig, we're going to be covering it. Um, Public opinion is firmly on the side of, of net zero and, and the energy transition. Um, more than half the public polled in August said that they want to see government tackle climate change with the same urgency um, with which they've tackled COVID. Um, although I'll, I'll leave people's judgment about the urgency with which they've tackled COVID to, to themselves. Uh, but you know what I mean, in terms of scale, it's the same crisis the level of crisis is the same in people's conceptions um, every parliament in in the house of commons has been elected on a pretty strong strong environmental mandate um, which includes plenty about the energy transition um, we've got a prime minister with a natural tendency to big and bold kind of flagship commitments he's made one or two in this area not least that every home will be powered by uh, offshore wind energy in the UK by two, by 2030. Um, we've got a string of commitments and policy initiatives that have been promised by ministers. Um, and another one of those big and bold commitments about putting um, 
right, build back better, basically. So, you know, a green recovery at kind of the heart of our, our national strategy as we try and emerge from, from COVID-19. Uh, as we were talking about a minute ago, we've got a natural focal point um, and a real clear demand for leadership in the context of the UK's presidency of COP26. Uh, and we've got a cross-party parliamentary consensus that strongly supports the energy transition. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment, actually. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but we're an all-party group, and all-party groups are the basis for their existence is, is political consensus and making sure that those conversations across party are happening and are meaningful. Um, and consensus is really important. It's what gave us the Climate Change Act. It's what gave us net zero. Uh, and it provides a really solid political foundation for the government to be ambitious, whatever government it is. And those two pieces of legislation that I just mentioned were delivered by by governments of, of different stripes. 2008, it was Labour. 2019, it was Conservative. Um, but here, uh, hopefully you can see it. We've done some part, some polling. It's loading up at the moment. Is ah, it there it is. There we go. We've done some polling of parliamentarians on their um, perspectives on the energy transition. Um, so what uh, we've actually published this yet, so I really shouldn't be sharing it, but um, here's a snapshot of it and we'll be publishing it next week. Um, what it shows basically is that there's a pretty strong consensus between the public and parliamentarians on the energy transition and it's it's all in it's all in favor of the transition obviously um so broadly it's it's to move away from fossil fuels and it's to it's to massively increase our investment and support for renewables there is a little bit on ccs in there um as well which is supportive um of you know ccs where fossil fuels are still essential um or where they can't be moved away from. And I just want to scroll down to, this is the cross, so this is, this first page is correlation between the public and parliamentarians. Yellow public, kind of gray is parliamentarians. Um, the, the next page is the, the cross party kind of divide. Well, it's Labour and Conservative divide. So you see actually that there is, a fairly you know a fairly strong amount of like consistent support um the only areas where there is a big difference between the parties really is on onshore wind um which isn't a massive surprise and shale gas fracking which isn't a massive surprise um but actually i think that you will see we'll do more of this over the course of this parliament and i think you'll see the consensus on both of those start to equal up a little bit but specifically, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse cursor, but fossil fuels fitted with CCS technology. Um, it's not as overwhelming as, as kind of solar or, or tidal or wave power, but it is still strong positive support for, um, for CCS technology where fossil fuels are needed. Um, and we'll publish this next week. I'll make sure you all receive a copy, but... Um, you know, this is a, an example of kind of the sort of work that we do as PRASEG and that that parliamentary consensus is a real, uh, it's an important thing. It's not, it's not something we should, um, we should just assume will always be there. It's something we have, have to actually kind of actively kind of nurture and incubate and, uh, and harness when the time's right. But then there's obviously some things that aren't so good. Um, some of the stuff I'll mention now is kind of, like big picture and some of it's a little bit about the detail but in the kind of biggest possible picture and this is my analysis my kind of personal analysis rather than the position of our chair Bima Falami or any of our officers um, in the old party group uh, but we have a system of government that isn't kind of very good at getting ahead of big problems it lends itself to big and bold commitments like the PM's wind announcement um, but it doesn't really lend itself to getting ahead of, of the big, big challenges. Democracies kind of tend to be about the here and now, and we're quite often walk right up to the edge of the cliff and have a good look over it before we, um, before we turn around uh, and 
find a way to walk it back and that won't cut it for an issue like climate change and it won't cut it on the energy transition i've just seen the question pop up there in the chat um sean uh, no it doesn't it means 24 percent uh, positive support but i will come back to that um at the end if that's okay and feel, do feel free to use the, the chat to ask more questions um where was i um yeah so uh, generally the system of government doesn't lend itself to long-term commitment and, and policy thinking and that's what we need like pretty much right now um secondly in terms of the political system that we've the structure it's kind of incapable of delivering net zero in its present form and by that i mean that local and combined authorities and devolved administrations are absolutely critical to the to the real world delivery of net zero and they in a like to a large degree lack the power and the resources to be able to to really deliver um uk 100 which is a big group of local and combined authorities that are committed to net zero are um going to be publishing a report before christmas which is a huge analysis of the powers that local authorities need have and more importantly lack um to be able to deliver on these issues and that's important for ccs I mean, not least because lots of this work is going to happen in the industrial clusters um, and combined authorities are going to be really important in, in terms of setting the kind of local um, economic priorities for the areas where the clusters are, um, like for where they exist. So like Teesside, for example, like there is an elected mayor up there. That voice and that local strategy is really important. And if the powers aren't coherent, and if there isn't a partnership between that local or that combined authority and national government, then things can start to break down or the, or the policy will become like less than some of its parts. Um, thirdly, like obviously right now we're in the middle of a massive crisis um, and it's an ongoing crisis. It obviously affects all of us in, in lots of ways, but specifically affects the energy transition, I think in two really important ways. First, a massive uncertainty about the amount of cash that's available. Uh, a lot of this stuff requires huge amounts of investment. And while the COVID-19 crisis has shown that government is capable of, of borrowing large amounts of money to invest, um, the national debt is now bigger than the entire economy. And there is already pressure on the government from their own backbenches to start to introduce a little bit of fiscal restraint. We can assume that the, the borrowing on this scale is going to be allowed to continue indefinitely, which does create problems for, for, for this area. And I think this that hasn't been helped by the fact that the comprehensive spending review has been delayed for another, probably another year. Uh, and this is after it was already delayed for a year. Um, in 2019 because of uncertainty surrounding Brexit. I mean, from an economic point of view, you can understand it because it's difficult to, to initiate a multi-year spend review, which gives departments certainty about exactly what they can spend when the economic picture is so unclear. But it's a problem. Um, it's one that we're going to have to stay mindful of. And, you know, what happens over the next kind of six months in terms of our economic outlook is going to be critical to, to what we can do in policy terms over the next five to 10 years. Um, and secondly, and we, we touched on this um, briefly just in the kind of introductory chat, but bandwidth is a massive issue. Um, the crisis has slowed everything down. Um, Brexit had already slowed everything down. Uh, an example of this is the Environment Bill, which it's actually set to go back into committee um, next week on the 3rd of November, um, which I think is on Tuesday. But when it does go back in, it won't have been seen for nearly 250 days. And that, I mean, it's a big bill, but it's only one, one example of something that's been delayed. And just to kind of, you know, try and give a summary of how important it is, the Environment Bill is the thing that um, that enshrines our legal protect uh, sorry enshrines our environmental protections in law um, 
you know, and it's re- so in that respect, it's relevant to the end of the Brexit transition period um, and allows those protections to be enforced. Uh, so either we've got, we've got a scenario now where once the end of the committee stage is reached and the report stage starts, which is the next stage when it comes back to the House of Commons, which the deadline for which is the 1st of December, there are still kind of seven or eight parliamentary kind of stages of the legislative process that that, that, that bill needs to go through um, between December the 1st and December the 31st when the transition period ends. That's 11 days of parliamentary time if parliament rises before like the Thursday before Christmas, which it would normally do um, for a, like a 250 page piece of legislation. So it's not going to happen. If it does happen, it'll happen with no scrutiny, but there's basically going to be a massive regulatory gap on environmental protections. And the Environment Bill is just one example. Another example is the Energy White Paper, which was first promised in May 2019 and which we're still waiting for. Um, and actually, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to pull up, I pulled together a list um, the other day of the things that we are expecting. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull it up on my screen and try and share it or at least read through it. Uh, I'll read through it and that might make it easier. So the final quarter of 2020, what have we been promised by ministers? By number 10, all the cabinet officers. Um, an updated nationally determined contribution, which is um, that's something that it's our national kind of climate commitment under the Paris Agreement, if you like. Um, the PM is hosting a, a, an ambition summit on the 12th of December, which is the fifth anniversary uh, of the Paris Agreement being signed. Uh, he is set to make a massive uh, speech on the green recovery, which will include a 10 point plan. Um, for climate change and energy transition um, before the end of November. From Bayes, we're expecting the energy white paper, the heat and building strategy, a funding model for CCS, um, a new carbon pricing scheme, and the national infrastructure strategy and a call for evidence for greenhouse gas removals. From the Treasury, the net zero review, the scaled back spending review, updated green book guidance on climate change from the Department of Transport, the Transport Decarbonisation Plan and a consultation um, on UK carbon pricing in the context of the shipping sector. Um, from DEFRA, a consultation on food waste reporting. Um, from the MOD, a review of climate change and defence. From the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, the Future Home Standard. Um, the Scottish government's supposed to be publishing its updated climate change plan. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the Committee on Climate Change is going to be publishing the sixth carbon budget. And that's all between now and the end of December and about the same number in the first two quarters of next year. So this is like quite a big log jam now that we've got. Um, and this is all happening at a time when, again, in my judgment, um, the some of the weaknesses civil service that has been it's been hollowed out a little bit and it's lacking in confidence and that's been a something that's happened like gradually over the last 10 years are being exposed so you've got a, a civil service which is not at the top of its game which is dealing with a massive crisis and facing the impact of brexit which is which has got to bring forward all of this stuff in the next few weeks um so it's a big big challenge um so kind of what do we do with all of that, like those um, those things that are in our favour and those things that are challenging. For the government, the important thing is that you've got to bring this stuff forward um, soon and make a big commitment, a meaningful commitment, backed up by detail to put the energy transition at the heart of the uh, the economic recovery from, from COVID. Um, I mean, it, obviously, it's something that we're all interested, but, interested in, but it's also the kind of the best route to a, a healthier, happier and more prosperous society in the long term. Um, uh, I think they need to put delivering net zero at the heart of the political reforms that they've got planned, most notably the devolution white paper and bill that will follow. Um, 
because it will it will give devolution a real purpose. Devolution isn't going; they're not going to roll it back. And I mean devolution within within England, um, as well as the devolved administration. So you've you've seen the voice that mayors have got now. Um, increasingly, I think that voice will be backed up by real powers. And I think giving those powers a purpose and making that purpose net zero makes an awful lot of sense. Not least because of the first thing that I said, which is that it is the shortest route to to a, a much more sustainable economy and a, um, a healthier and happier society. And thirdly, they need to explicitly put climate leadership and diplomacy at the heart of the UK's kind of global identity um, going forward. Um, and that's quite easy to do, given the uh, the number of things that we're responsible for delivering on the global stage next year and how focused on climate change they either are or need to be. Um, but what it means for us is, I mean, there's a lot of different kind of groups or, or interests represented on this call. And I say us in the broadest sense. So any of us that are interested in these issues or attached to organisations that work on them is our job is just to continue to make the case relentlessly um, to, you know, keep challenging yourselves and to come up with better ideas and to communicate those ideas to the people who make these decisions, you know, respond to consultations, write to the chairs of select committees, respond to their inquiries, go and give evidence, you know, write to Prasag and to the chairs of all the different all party groups, because we'll make sure those, that, that, that your perspectives and your expertise gets out there because a better debate, a better quality of political debate and a better atmosphere for all of these different announcements that the government's got to make to you know if that if there's a better more informed more committed atmosphere that receives them then the decisions are going to end up being better and given the scale of of some of those things that we're waiting for how critically are not just for for the uk but also for um you know given our diplomatic kind of prominence on on issues around climate change and energy like for the whole world, like it couldn't be more important time to do it. Um, I think that's, I've been rambling for long enough now. I, hopefully it wasn't too much of a ramble, but um, hopefully there's something in there which is which is interesting. Um, I'm more than happy to like answer any questions or develop any of that stuff a little bit further. Um, I guess, John, back to you to, to take us forward from here. Yes, well, um... Questions, uh, Karis can look out for raised hands if we can do that or put questions on the on the chat. Um, I've got a question though, Don. You mentioned climate diplomacy briefly, mm -hmm. but obviously the UK can deliver net zero and it won't, that of itself, obviously won't avert dangerous climate change. And the, the sad fact is that the whole world has to get to net zero pretty quickly. Otherwise, it, it won't happen. I mean, how much do you think that's been taken on? Because it's it's not a nice message, but it's the obvious reality. Been taken on by the the world or by UK politicians? Well, I guess by UK politicians because you know there's a, there's a I guess a, a fairly sort of a common phrase that says, "Oh, you know, we've got to cut our emissions to get to net zero." Uh, to avert climate change, and that's that's true, but it's hardly the full story. Mm. So, and, 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 you know, and it, 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 to the extent that the UK can do things that influence the global outcome, it's the only way it'll get any real payback on on doing that stuff. Yeah. So. Com like it's a very simple question and the answer has several parts and I apologize if this isn't a, a coherent answer but there's there are different bits to it I think from a UK perspective there are a couple of, like the two kind of key stages of leadership as I see them like first of all to lead by example and then secondly to bring others together and stretch their commitments as far as they'll go Leading by example means delivering net zero. And I think being a, you know, a major industrialized economy as we, we kind of still are and have always been a bit of a leader on this stuff, like the UK doing something 
like passing a piece of net zero legislation is heard around the world, definitely. And one of the things we do have is still a fairly a fairly sizable and respected diplomatic service. So if you talk to previous um, previous secretaries of state for energy and climate change, so um, as part of a discussion with Ed Davey, who was in there for the UK between like, the time of the coalition government, and next week actually Prasek's helping to organise a um, a briefing for MPs about the UK's NDC, part of which, um, a part of the panel of which will be Amber Rudd, who led the UK's delegation to Paris. Um, certainly, Ed Davis said that two of the big unsung heroes of of the Paris Agreement were, um, it might have been overstating it, but it was interesting, with David Miliband and William Hague, who in their roles as successive foreign secretaries had instructed the diplomatic service to to work hard in places like India and China to get them to come to the table with a little bit more. And it might have only been a tiny, um, a tiny impact in the grand scheme of things, but you know, if there's enough tiny impacts, then it becomes quite a big impact. So the UK still does have some sway and its example, I think, is part of that. I think there's an argument that basically the from a geopolitical point of view, the two big players are obviously the US and China um, and I know there's a lot of different opinions on Brexit and I think you know to be respected everybody's individual viewpoint um, but I think the only credible kind of political and economic counterweight to the US and China is the European Union and I think we probably do suffer for not being at the forefront of the EU given that the EU negotiates as one when it comes to the COP. So the UK used to be kind of a prominent part of the, the EU's delegation as well as having a de delegation in its own right. But it doesn't mean that the UK's voice won't be won't be important in trying to bring um, <coughs> bring kind of maximum commitments from other countries and, you know, like leveraging our alliances as, as much as we can. Um, but then the other bit of it is that, you know, you'll have seen China's commitment for net zero by 2060. Japan's made a commitment this week. South Korea's made a commitment this week. Obviously, we've got the US election next week. And if, you know, not that it's all about kind of, you know, one person or another, but if Biden wins, then you're looking at probably 85% of the world's emissions coming under um, under political administrations that have made commitments around net zero. Um, so no, the UK doing it on its own, isn't in itself anything like enough, but the UK doing it and and using its what diplomatic influence it has is still significant, and it's so it's certainly significant enough to give it the best possible shot that you can. Um, from a Prasag point of view, one thing we're exploring is whether we can help to build alliances with parliamentarians in the countries where a brave move is required from, from their government and to make sure they've got as much political support as possible. Um, whether that's something that we can play a meaningful role in or not, I think is an open question still, but it's certainly something we're exploring because we're really committed to making sure that um, we do everything we can to make the, to make the COP as successful as possible. Um, yeah, but it's, I mean, ultimately it's going to come down to, it's going to come down to, world leaders have been in, in one room and agreeing with each other. Um, yeah. Does that remotely answer the question? Yes. No, that's, that's, that's very interesting. It, it's a, as you say, a reasonable awareness. Um, Jennifer, you want to ask your question, Don? You can see some questions coming in the chat, Don. Uh, you don't want me to unmute for too long. We've got a heat pump going in and the noise is horrendous. Okay. Don, do you, you see Jennifer's question? I'm just looking now. Um, opinions on how important people in power are, for example, individuals. Um, Claire Perry was a figurehead for a while. It is no longer COP26 president, makes it a big change. Gender parity and leadership. How will this have an impact? Very, very good question. Very important question. Um, yeah, the government's come, rightly come under a lot of um, criticism for the fact that the delegation is all male uh, i don't expect that to to remain the case i think it will change um i think 
the the person in the person in the role makes a big difference and that's not just about the person who's got the presidency or who's responsible for the presidency at the moment that's Alex Sharma it's not just about who the prime minister is it's you know it's throughout the system and the COP26 team out of the cabinet office I've had quite a lot of contact with over the next few weeks and you know I just from a personal point of view from my experience of working with them like get a lot of confidence from them like a very capable team very committed um very impressive um i think there's a problem at the moment that the secretary of state for business energy and industrial strategy has got a role that is so broad that it's hard um for the cop presidency to be the number one priority at the moment and that's a problem it's definitely a problem i think the question around gender parity obviously we touched on it that it's, that it's just wrong in itself but it's wrong from from the point of view of if you you know if you want to have good diplomatic outcome then you've got to have the broadest possible team um i personally think that um that claire perry would have made a very good cop president i think that Claire Perry was instrumental in um, in making sure that the net zero legislation happened. Very committed and very impressive minister, and worked with worked well with Theresa May to make sure that it it did happen. Uh, Amber Rudd deserves a lot of credit as well. Um, there is a lot of ability out there that I think is not part of this that could be at the moment. Um, and again, this is very much a, a personal viewpoint, but. Um, politics is extremely factional at the moment, and I think that the breadth of the COP delegation that we've got suffers from that right now. Um, and I, I think we need um, a much kind of broader approach if we're going to make it as successful as it could be. Um, but you get the right person in there with the right level of commitment, it can make a huge difference. There was just, there's been rumours that Theresa May might end up becoming the the, um, the COP president or taking that role. Um, right now, I can't see that happening um, just because of the relationship that uh, is reported to exist between her and the Prime Minister, which is kind of pretty non-existent. But um, it will be interesting if it did happen. Yeah. Um Steve, Vincent, want to ask your question? Yes, I was just wondering uh, what are your thoughts about the commercialization of CCS and what role government plays in that, which, well, obviously, presumably comes around setting appropriate carbon taxes and these sorts of things, but I'll let you answer the question rather than prejudge your answer. Um. So I'm, this is where I come back to not being a massive expert in CCS. So I might need to take the question away and do a little bit more thinking about it. Um, but I mean, part of the part of the issue that we've got is that there is no kind of national framework for this stuff at the moment. I think ultimately that's the role for government to set a proper tone, a proper national tone for um, for not just for CCS but across the whole of the energy transition and. That's that's like a lot of what we're waiting for. Um, so at the minute, there's just like loads of unanswerable questions because because we've not seen the detail of any of, of the government's thinking. Um, but I think from a just from, from like an ideological point of view, we've got a government that is now I think much more prepared to be interventionist than than the previous conservative government or the coalition government before it. Um, but I, I think that they will want to stop short of actually delivering lots of things. So it will be very much set in a policy framework rather than actually getting sleeves rolled up and, and getting the state to deliver. Um, but I, exactly how it work, I'm not sure. If if you would, I don't know if there's a way that we can kind of follow up directly, but I would like to be able to take that question away and, and do a bit more thinking about it if, if that's okay. That would be interesting. Nice. Yeah, yeah, if Steve wants to drop me his email, I can send it on to you. Yeah, well, if you wanted to do a little little article for a newsletter or something, Dom, that would be very, very appreciated too. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, that would okay. be interesting. Yeah. Well, 
we set to have lots of things to be to talk about if all of these announcements actually do happen this side of the year, this side of Christmas. We'll have a lot to talk about if half of them happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yoran Brigston, that answer your question? And say where you're from, if you don't mind, Yoran. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, John. Um, it was more or less like Steve's question, how, how you see the incentive structure for, for the change in the in UK. So if um, you... Yeah. Sorry. No, the incentive structure for, for the transition. Um, if it's more high carbon taxes or more like the US 45Q system or... So it's uh, a bit uh, similar to this question from Steve. So it's the this currently is apparently the subject of quite a big argument inside government between the Treasury and uh, Bayes. Um, so whether it be a emissions trading scheme that would incentivise um, obviously lower emissions or a carbon tax. Um, that apparently is going to be sorted out this year, but like there's no clarity on exactly when that's going to happen. Um, my understand, I'm just going to go. I've made some notes about this earlier, so if you bear with me a second, I might just try and 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 dig them out. But my understanding is that base favors a um, an ETS and that the Treasury favors a carbon tax. Um, so in the battle between any department and the Treasury, you would always expect the Treasury to win, but um, but from any of the experts that I've spoken to, technically, I understand that that's more, much more difficult to achieve. Um, whether this is something that will be kicked kind of down the road again because the spending review has been, um, been pushed back and there will be no budget um, between now and the end of the year, I'm not sure because... Like ultimately, if you're going to introduce um, a new system of taxation or a new way of, of creating fiscal incentives, you need a budget to be able to do it. And really, that budget needs to be backed by a long-term spending review. So um, I think, you know, we might end up with more long-term uncertainty around this, which will be unhelpful. Um, but again, you know, it's something that's been promised and it's been promised again since the spending review was was delayed. So um, it's very much a kind of watch this space, but another example of where the delays that we've got in policy development and delivery is starting to become a real problem. And then, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, on, on the... The parliamentary business and, and all the, I mean, what sounds like an overcommitment. I mean, do your members, are your members able to help to reduce that? I mean, do, can you, for example, uh, you know, as you say, build consensus and, and get things passed more quickly? Is that, do you see that as something you can possibly do? As a parliamentary group, um, I think. I think for our role ultimately is to make sure that, that the quality of debate around these issues is there and the knowledge is elevated across parliament, which means that MPs are much more capable of scrutinizing the stuff that the government does introduce. Um, if, we can, if we can help to maintain and enhance the political consensus, then that, that's great. Um, I mean, MPs aren't always going to agree on everything, but I think, you know, there is a there is broad agreement that the transition needs to happen and there is, you know, broad agreement on um, on how it needs to happen at the moment. I think the problem that we've got at the moment is less about whether MPs will agree. It's more about the way that things have been introduced or the way that they aren't being introduced because right now things either aren't being brought forward by government or they're being brought forward in such a way that the opportunity for scrutiny isn't there. Um, so like, for example, with the, um, with the environment bill, either they're going to have to railroad it through, which doesn't, isn't just the problem about a lack of scrutiny of one specific legislation. It's another example and another occasion when the sentiment from parliament towards the government is affected by what parliament deems to it 
to kind of being treated poorly by the government, basically. Um, so you've got a kind of an emotional problem as well as a practical problem. But if it's not railroaded through and if there is sufficient scrutiny, then by definition, we're going to have a massive regulatory gap, which is a failure. And I think these failures mount up and it gets to the point where the relationship breaks down to such a degree that um, that it it doesn't become about line by line scrutiny or detailed scrutiny. It becomes much more about political point scoring. And if that becomes the dominant um, environment in which these announcements are made, then we'll all suffer for it because the policy will will be less effective. Um, so there is a role for us to play in, there's a big role for us to play in making sure that the issues are aired, in making sure that ministers are asked about when these promises are going to be kept. Um, it's unlikely that we as a group would take a particular kind of activist position on a piece of legislation because we're not a lobbying group. You know, we're a, we're a platform for discussion, for debate, for knowledge to be shared, for parliamentarians and decision makers to hear the perspectives and the expertise of industry, of people like yourselves. Um, and, you know, I encourage you all to think about joining Prasek because, you know, the broader and the, the deeper a platform is, the stronger its, its voice is. Um, but there's a limit to, you know, to, the, to our ability to drive forward the legislative agenda. Ultimately, that does come down to government actually introducing these pieces of legislation. Um, where they are good, there will be, I'm pretty sure they'll be passed with consensus and net zero is a really good example of that. The Climate Change Act in 2008 is a good example of that. And the consensus between those two, you know, across those 11 years stayed intact. I think only eight parliamentarians across both houses voted against the Climate Change Act. Um, but the more delay that there is and the more, um, like the less information is coming out of government on this stuff, the more frustration is going to build in parliament and the more animosity will build and that doesn't help us. Then just, just making a very sort of parochial uh, request, really. I mean, you, you suggested that we, we sort of be proactive on um, carbon capture and storage, which is, is good. What would you say, if anything, and maybe, maybe it isn't even evident, what do you think the energy deficit is in Parliament on carbon capture and storage? That's a, that's a good question. So knowledge um, is one of them. So there's a role for us there as an all party group that's interested in these issues to get debate going, to make sure that MPs are hearing about why it's important and why it works and how it can be economical. Um, to unpack that that CCC kind of conclusion that it's a vital part of the transition, an essential part of the mix. The question that is, sorry, just to interrupt, but of course, Committee on Climate Change talk about carbon capture and storage, and they mean quite a number of different things, you know, from carbon removal from the air, carbon capture from industry, power, hydrogen. I mean, is, so even there, there's a number of different topics. I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know how much that's picked up or if it's just CCS, CCUS. And it, yeah, so assume that it's not picked up. Assume that a handful of parliamentarians will know the detail around CCS, you know, the, to, the, to the extent that, that you would hope that they do anyway. Um, why, why is there such a gap in knowledge? Partly because it's complicated and MPs are busy, and, but partly because... When it comes to the energy transition, this is some of the stuff that isn't massively relevant to uh, to their constituents' lives. In if faced with some, like you know, like if, if you had to choose to learn about one thing and it was retrofit or CCS, then as an ordinary MP, particularly for an area that's outside an industrial cluster, you're going to pick retrofit because it's the thing that's related to fuel poverty effectively and being able to deal with it in your constituency. So, so knowledge and relevance to the day-to-day -day lives of their constituents, I think, are the two big barriers. But you can overcome both of those barriers by working, first of all, with the kind of 
the technical bits of parliament which are going to be working on this stuff. So the Treasury Committee, the Bayes Committee, all of them will have, in fact, do have open inquiries that are massively relevant. The sixth carbon budget will be published and it'll be an opportunity for, for these issues to be raised. And like John, obviously, I'd love to talk about making sure that Praseg can can get these issues out there and and really start to unpack them for MPs. But from a strategic point of view, focus on the MPs who represent places where CCS is going to be relevant to their constituents' lives, where it's going to create jobs, you know, where it's going to be impactful in in the industrial clusters that that you know are in the seats that they represent. Because you know, it's like it's, the best one in the world. It's not going to be massively relevant to an MP that's that's representing an area where where CCS isn't really a isn't really a thing. But you know, there are areas where it's going to be a big part of, you know, the, where people in their constituency are going to be employed, like make it relevant to them and they will start to listen uh, and try and unpack it in a way that makes it easy for them to understand. Okay, that's, uh, that's good advice. Very good advice. Anybody else got any questions? Like it done. Okay, well, Dom, thanks very much. That's a really fantastic tour de force with no slides. It's a reminder of what parliamentarian trained people can do. So that's, that's very, very good. And a very interesting insight. And very, well, I wouldn't say encouraging because I don't think it is. I think times are a bit hard, but very informative. So th thanks a lot. Very much. Thanks for having me, John. Um, and Karis for organising it. Um, if anybody does want to, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put my email address in the chat if anybody wants to follow up, um, or maybe we could share it um, afterwards. I'd be more than happy to pick up any of these issues, um, more than happy to talk about how Prasek can can help to get these issues a little, uh, discussed a little bit more in Parliament. Uh, and I know that it was quite top line, so it didn't go into CCS in detail. Um, but again, we can do that and follow up if it's useful to people. But, but I appreciate the chance to be part of it. It's a great series. I've learned a lot from watching those webinars back. So um, I hope it's been useful. Yeah, thanks very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. That was really interesting. Um, and like, it was really interesting discussion afterwards as well, like really engaging with a lot of different questions. So thank you everyone for posing your questions as well for, for Dom today. Um, just to let people quickly know what's coming up next week. So we're going to be hearing next week from Nigel Genvey from Gaffney Klein, and he'll be giving us an overview of the Natural Petroleum Council's meeting the dual challenge report on at scale deployment of CCUS, which is um, a, a report that went out at the start of the year. Um, so looking forward to having Nigel with us next week. Um, but yeah, thank you again for today, Don. That was really interesting. Thanks, Carrie. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thank Bye you. Everyone.